My name is Don Cabas. I'm the general manager of Great Lakes Crane. Um, I want to thank everybody today for, for a showing up and we would really like to do these meetings in person if, if possible. Um, however, COVID is making us do these presentations virtually and so we're trying to get our, our message across through these, uh, through these meetings. So, hey, thanks everybody for showing up. Thanks everybody for your business as well. Um, you'll see on the screen, we've got some poll questions to get us started off here. And, and just to begin, um, you know, number one is who will win the Super Bowl? The, the Bengals or the Rams? So you can put your vote in there. Um, we'll, uh, we'll be using that for betting later, I'm sure. What is your favorite brand of tractor? We've got John Deere, we've got red and green and orange and yellow and others. So John Deere, Case, Kubota, or New Holland or others. Please fill those in. Um, another piece here is what is your primary news source? Is it social media, TV, radio, newspaper? Uh, so if you could put those in. And also uh, our last question, our first poll here is, which crop returns are the most, uh, which crop returns the most profit per acre on your farm? Wheat, soybeans, corn, or other. So be interesting to see what our poll results are. And once those are in, Jackie will show the results on our screen. So if, um, just a couple of housekeeping points. If you do have questions, you can hit the Q&A on the bottom of your screen. Um, or you can text your question to, uh, to Rachel, who's on, going to be doing our question and answer period. Her text number is 519-818-0737. So, Rachel, so Jackie, we can see what the poll's like here. And um, is that different than this morning? I think it is. This morning, I think we had the Bengals up first and the Rams um, in second, but that's Switched it around here this afternoon. Um, most viewers today are are liking John Deere tractors. The red ones are right behind it, so pretty close, pretty close race there. And when we look at where are we getting our primary media sources from, uh, it is social media. Where fifty percent of you are saying that is where that's coming. From. Um, the last question is, which crop returns the most profit per acre and it is leaning to corn. We believe that's leaning to corn and has been for the last little bit. So appreciate everybody putting those, um, putting your answers in here. That's great, great information. I just thought I'd take a couple of minutes just to, just to talk about some of the things that we've got going on. Um, there's my contact information. If you ever need to call me or send me an email, there is my, my uh, email address or my phone number if you want to text or call please please feel free um i'm just going to go through a few slides here that talk a little bit about what we do and great lakes grain is really a, a co-op dealing with other co-ops farmers started co-ops years ago to build purchasing and market strength purchasing power and market strength and they were kind of started out as buying clubs and then after a little bit co-ops grew together and and then they formed regional co-ops so that they could combine all their buying power and some of their selling power and put that together. So Great Lakes Grain is a partnership of co-ops that's owned by farmers for the benefit of farmers. So we are truly a, a co-op of co-ops. Um, Great Lakes Grain has three co-op members. One is Agris Co-op, um, south and west of London that has about a thousand or 1100 farmer owners. Emperin Co-op in Eastern Ontario is a full service co-op with many divisions. They have um, not only grain and agronomy, but they have a grocery store. They have um, a, a Rona, a hardware store. They have a feed business. They have an energy business. So Emperin is a really, really full service co-op in Eastern Ontario. Then we have Growmark FS Partners, which is kind of in our middle geography. Here's a bit of a footprint of where Great Lakes Grain is. Um, you can see we're fairly heavy, heavily concentrated in the south, um, and we have a have Embram up in the in the far east in in the Ottawa Valley. So we do get a pretty good cross section of Ontario uh, through our through our geography. 
I just thought we'd go over a couple of slides here to kind of show some of the dollars that we've been spending and some of the some of the action items that we've been working on. So we just commissioned air this summer. We added 750,000 bushels of storage plus a, a 15,000 bushel per hour intake. So that was really well received in the air geography. Uh, we had some issues with the build on that. We had lost a couple of bins through due to a, a windstorm. So we finally got that project up and running and it's fully in place. Uh, last fall or this past year, we added a bin in Brigden, which was commissioned through our wheat harvest. So the bin on the right at the end of the concrete silos was a 140,000 bushel bin we added there as we took some old silos out of commission. Um, we've added in Chatham uh, a couple of new intakes and sped up the, the intake speed, plus added more storage to that Chatham facility and really did a, did a nice upgrade there, added uh, close to 400,000 bushels of space there. In Glencoe, this was operational for the fall of 2020, sorry, 2021. We added that, um, that last bin. Um, so that's actually been two years. That's been in operation, 100,000 bushels. So it's really helped out the flexibility at Glencoe as well. Um, what We have a couple other projects on the go on the Agris side of the fence. Um, we are uh, exiting our Thamesford location. And with that, we're adding more space uh, at some other locations. And so Stony Point, we're adding 400,000 bushels of space there, plus a, a new grain dryer that will dry 3,000 bushels per hour. So we're pretty excited with that. That should be in place by uh, harvest, this harvest of uh, 22 crop. There you can see the foundation of the bin has been started. So we've been uh, kind of got that rolling there at Stony Point. Um, we have a big, big project at Grand Valley. We're adding 700,000 bushel of space and really just kind of starting over behind the existing elevator. So we're going to add lots of speed and space at Grand Valley. And we're pretty happy to get that started. Um, we also have plans for next summer, summer of 23, to get Dutton uh, retrofitted and add some more space and drying there as well. So we've got uh, lots of activity going on in the in the capital front. And, and to remind everybody that we are a co-op of co-ops and every dollar we spend is a farmer's dollar and every dollar we make is a farmer's dollar. So that's a, we are a, truly a farmer-owned co-op and and we're really proud of, of where we've come over the last number of years. So I think just a couple of things to um, think about here as we get into Jeff's presentation, you know, how much risk do we take off the table? How much, how do we, how do we keep playing this game of marketing over the next number of months? And how will you plan for 22 and 23 crops? So we want to, we want to be there and help you do those things as you get into your um, planning season or planning and planting season. And how can we kind of help you maximize your returns on, on this grain business? Uh, next up, we have Owen Roberts. Owen Roberts um, comes to us out of our air location. And Owen is going to talk a little bit about some of our online tools that we can use that you can, you can manage your business day or night uh, 24 hours a day. So, um, Owen, you are up, my friend. As, as Don said, I work out of the uh, AIR branch at, for Great Lakes Grain as a grain originator. AIR services farms, and I work with farmers in Waterloo, Grant, and Oxford area. I'm really passionate about making your business profitable and hope that these slides can move you towards your business goals. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce the Great Lakes Grain Online Offer Center and the MyGrain account. These two separate online tools allow you to take more control of your grain marketing and to access your grain records to help manage your farm and tame, tame your record keeping needs. At any time, please use the chat function to enter any questions you may have through the presentation or text your questions to the number on the screen. The first step in gaining more control of your grain marketing is registering 
and logging on into your online Aqua Center. To do that, simply follow the link to the cash bids page from our home page at the upper left hand side of your screen. Once the bid paid, bids page loads, you will see highlighted the username and password. And I'll log in here. If you don't have a login, you'll need to create one on the register link just below to create a free account. Uh, once you've logged in, you can view our elevator, farm picked up values or direct delivered bids for all of our popular destinations. In this case today, we're viewing the IGPC Elmer bids. If you want to directly manage your marketing offers, you have the ability to enter online offers yourself and sell grain to any of the listed bid locations. Simply click the make an offer link on your preferred shipment month that suits your needs. In this example, we will pick the February 2022 bid into IGPC. A new window will open, as you see here, where you can fill in uh, your desired terms of a contract, such as the number of bushels and the, desi the desired price that you want. In this case, we're going to sell 10,000 bushels of corn delivered to IGPC Elmer for $8 if the market continues to rally from its current 798 and three quarters. When you filled in the selling details that you want, click the submit for confirmation. A confirmation window will display all of the details of your offer and you'll have to check the box on the lower left hand side to proceed with creating the offer. Let's finish this by clicking create an offer. It's that simple to create your own offers and market your grain. This can be done in either the comfort of your home or on the go in the seat of the tractor from your mobile device. This is a brief summary of the online offer center <clears throat> and how it can be used. I would encourage you to get yourself set up with a login and call your local originator to begin your marketing. The next online tool that's become more recently available is the My Grain Account Portal, also sometimes called Frontier. Do you find yourself working on weekends and evenings and need access to your grain records? In that case, My Grain Account is the tool for the job. You can find the link for My Grain Account beside the cash bids link on our homepage. Clicking on this link gives you the option to create an account or log in with an existing account. If you've never logged in, before, you'll need to create an account, and this will be separate from the online offer center login. That way, you can control who has access to your records, separate from who has access to making marketing decisions using the online offer center. This is what the login for my grain account looks like. Once logged in, there will be a number of useful things you can do. My favorite th three things available are reviewing uh, your uh, inbound tickets to our elevators in real time during harvest to monitor yield data from a mobile device, look up previous settlements and payments for your bookkeeping or crop yield data or uh, your crop insurance reporting needs. And thirdly, we are going to review how to confirm a contract. So the first thing to do is to click on the contracts on the left side, then click confirm contract. A new window or a, a new a display of the contracts that need to be confirmed or signed uh, will come up. You click on the contract you want to confirm. You can see here the column in the middle shows the uh, no for this confirm for this contract is shown. When you click on it, uh, a window will open showing all of the terms of the contract. You'll want to review the commodity, quantity sold, delivery location, and of course the price. And then you click confirm. And then there's no more printing, scanning, faxing, or mailing required. 
Lastly, a gentle reminder, we offer electronic fund transfer for grain payments. Don't let your local mail person be the gatekeeper to your finances and enroll today for quicker and more secure payments. And uh, now we'll go to um, uh, the, our next survey. Questions? Uh, first question is, did you get your intended weed acres planted? Yes or no? Have input costs changed your normal agronomy practices? Yes, no, or we're watching closely. Are you planning any capital purchases before a potential interest rate increase? Yes or no? And do you have a grain marketing plan in place? Yes, no, or no, I still do a marketing plan. Or no, I still need to do a marketing plan. I'll just give everybody a minute to get their answers in. <clears throat> okay, here are the answers. Did you get your win winter wheat acres planted? 57% said yes. Um, have input costs changed your normal agronomy practices? 23% say yes, 42% uh, say no. And uh, seems like there's a, a large 35% watching closely. I imagine they're undecided at this point. Are you planning any capital purchases before potential interest rate increases? 30% are saying yes. And uh, uh, Seventy percent are saying no, and uh, number four: Do you have any grain market? Uh, do you have a grain marketing plan in place? And uh, uh, excellent job getting sixty-four percent with a yes, twenty-one percent with a no, and uh, fifteen percent still need to do a marketing plan. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, at the end of this we can get that number up convincing people to, to do some more. So um, the, uh, the next step here is I'm gonna hand this off to, um, to uh, Rachel. Um, Perfect. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, thanks. thanks, Owen. Yeah, so thanks for uh, doing the overview of Frontier and Cash Bids. Um, I think everyone should take advantage of it. It's really good for your own business and to keep things in track. Um, just before we really dive into things, we actually have a few questions that have kind of jumped in pretty quick here. So I think Dawn's going to help. Um, one of the questions we saw, Dawn, was why does the price of corn vary between um, like locations or elevators? Can you touch on that subject for us? Well, I, I think we have a, a few different pieces. If, we, if you're logged in, you can see end user bids. So you could see Hiram Walkers or Greenfield or IGPC, which is a different bid for a different month um, than maybe our local elevator bid. So our elevator bid is for the delivery either this month or say for new crop. But if we have um, a direct delivered bid, that would include um, freight getting it to that end user. Um, it would also show, you know, if we have farm bids that are spread out between now and, you know, we have almost a farm bid for every month showing out. So, you know, some of those reasons would be there as well, Rachel, that we've got lots of um, lots of bids that are spread out. I think today, Rachel, we have over 900 bids for grain to any of various locations. So I think we just have a whole, a whole tremendous amount of them. So if anybody has questions about those, certainly please call our, uh, any of our locations. Yeah, perfect. Um, and then I guess one of the other quick questions we had before we jump into things was we're, we're asked how many people are actually watching tonight. So we have about 200, uh, give or take here of producers watching. So it's going to be uh, quite the event today. So I guess since Jeff is here, we're going to jump into it. Um, as Don said, my name is Rachel Dewsbury and I'm the grain originator for the Essex County region. So I'll be handling the Q&A session for today. Uh, but just again, before we jump in, Let's just review how it works. So if you have any questions for Jeff or our team, please either add them in the chat function at the bottom of your screen, uh, add them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, or text your questions to me at 519-818-0737. And what we'll do is we'll answer them at the end of Jeff's presentation. 
Um, so yeah, like now let's jump into the presentation. I'm gonna pass it over to Jeff Sherman, who's our commodity risk consultant for Medco Commodities. This is Jeff's 13th year, giving us his much anticipated market update. So thank you as always for taking the time to be with us today, Jeff. Take it away, the floor is yours. Thank you for taking the time to log on to your computer and giving me the opportunity to visit with you about what's going on in commodity markets. I am disappointed uh, that we can't have um, in-person meetings. I had high hopes that maybe uh, we would be able to have in-person meetings this year, um, but that did not materialize. And I'm certainly, certainly looking forward to the day when we can all roam freely without fear of becoming ill or have restrictions or mandates. <clears throat> I have found it interesting over the past 12 months and more so the past eight months that depending on where a person lives, how different our lives have been simply due to how the authorities have handled this whole COVID thing. And my life has certainly been different than those who live in California. And it has also been different than those who live in my neighboring state of Illinois. And that's just been simply due to uh, how the authorities have handled this whole COVID situation. And obviously my life's been different than my Canadian friends. And this is just my opinion as an American. And, and, and uh, I really struggled with how to even approach this. But if you were to visit me today here in Iowa, you wouldn't even know that we're in a pandemic. The local news media does not report on it daily. When they do, it's usually a 60 to 90 second clip. Um, I give my grandson lots of, lots of love and lots of hugs. Our little ones, they go to school every day. They're not required to, re to wear face coverings unless they want to. Our kids have been participating in extracurricular activities. Uh, fans and parents are welcome to attend. There's no one standing at the door asking to see an ID or a vaccination status. My wife and I, we go to bars and restaurants. We get together with family and friends. We attend church services and we visit our loved one in the long-term care facilities. Now, I don't know if this is the right way or the wrong way. I don't make the rules. I'm just living within the rules that's been established. Um, but obviously, this is different than what my Canadian friends have been living. And, um, you know, uh, just recently, uh, it, it's obvious that, that some uh, Canadians are starting to push back. Now, I don't have a horse in this race, uh, but I have been watching it from afar, as has been a lot of other people throughout the world. And... I would just encourage you, regardless of how you feel about this, and I know that this is a very, very sensitive subject, and it's a sensitive subject here as well, but I would encourage you, regardless of how you feel about this, to be proud. Be proud that you live in a country where you have the right to demonstrate, because that is not the case everywhere throughout the world. And even if you don't agree, be proud of your fellow country men and women for showing the rest of the world and especially us Americans that you can have a demonstration and it can be done in a peaceful manner. This is something we can no longer do here in the United States. We have proven numerous times that when we have a large scale demonstration, we are gonna tear some things up light some stuff on fire, and if the front door is locked, we will knock it down and loot the joint, even if it's the U.S. Capitol. So be thankful, be proud. You live in a country where you still have the right to demonstrate. 
and be glad that it's being done in a peaceful manner. Life is good on the farm. This is a picture of my wife's great grandfather and his three daughters. That is a Fortson tractor. Forts and tractors became available for sale in the United States in October of 1970. That the pat picture is dated 1918. And so I'm assuming that's a brand new tractor, most likely his very first tractor. Life on the farm was good in 1918. Life on the farm in 2021 was good as well. Net farm income up 23% versus a year ago, net farm income here in the U.S. up 47% in the last two years. U.S. farmers still got 20% of his income in the form of a government payment, but that was down from almost 40% of two years ago. Iowa land values up in an incredible 29% in this past year. Life on the farm's been good, and I anticipate life on the farm in 2022 to be uh, good as well. There's a lot of positives out here. We still have strong demand. There's some production concerns in South America that's supporting the markets. Um, China's still buying large quantities of ag, just not quite as much as they did a year ago. We have strong biofuel demand. COVID fear is slowly dissipating and the world is slowly figuring out how to live with COVID. My concerns, of course, Ukraine and Russia, um, U.S.-China relations remain tense, maybe not as tense as they were a year ago. <coughs> uh, there's still $13 billion worth of ag goods that China uh, agreed to purchase under the phase one trade agreement that uh, they fell short on. U.S. officials have still got to figure out a way to deal with that. And my biggest concern of all is inflation, especially food and energy inflation, um, because that is continuing to widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots. China has a zero COVID policy. That is a concern as well. Should there be a large outbreak of COVID across China due to their zero COVID policy, that could uh, play into the supply chain disruptions. And I'm afraid that Biden and Trump will both run for president in 2024. U.S. corn ending stocks pegged at 1.54 billion bushels. Now, tomorrow, the USDA will release updated supply and demand numbers. So all these data that I show you here this evening, that will get changed slightly in tomorrow's WASDE report. But in the January report, they had corn ending stocks pegged at 1.54 billion bushels. The average trade estimate for the Mars report has stocks falling to 1.498 billion bushels. Stocks to use ratio at 10.3%. Now, the question going forward <coughs> is, does this corn ending stocks number get larger or smaller as we move throughout the marketing year? I am fairly comfortable and confident that this corn ending stocks number does not get any bigger. Uh, how much smaller it gets is going to largely hinge on exports, and I'll talk about those here in a little bit. The USDA is estimating our corn uh, usage for feed will be up almost 50 million bushels versus a year ago. The USDA has our corn feed usage number up 50 million bushels versus a year ago, and our first quarter feed usage was actually down 3.7% versus a year ago. Now you could take this data and make an argument that maybe the USDA is overstating the amount of corn that we're going to feed in the US this year. I am not ready to make that statement yet. I wanna wait until we see the second quarter feed data before I make a hard line projection on that. Corn use for ethanol production up almost 300 million bushels this year. Our weekly corn grind rate has been consistently running above what's needed to
to meet the USDA target. I think at the end of the year, our corn usage for ethanol production will be up 50 to 75 million bushels from where it's currently estimated at. There are some people who think it could be up as much as 100 million bushels. U.S. corn exports, and this is the wild card. U.S. corn exports are estimated to be down 12% versus a year ago. The USDA has their corn exports estimated to be down 12% versus a year ago. <laughs> and our year-to-date corn export inspections are down 14% versus a year ago. And our export sales are down almost 20% versus a year ago. Now, you certainly could take this raw export data and make an argument that the USDA is overstating the amount of corn we're going to export out of the U.S. this year. Today, the U.S. Census Bureau released export data for December. U.S. corn exports through December is actually up 148 million bushels versus a year ago. What's this tell me? This tell me tells me, we've got to back up here. The year-to-date corn exports are 148 million bushels larger than the inspections data. Now, what does this tell me? This tells me that the inspections data is maybe not that accurate this year in gauging what corn exports are going to be. And I think a large part of that is it's struggling to account for the corn that's moving across the border into Canada. And there's a lot of wild cards here in the U.S. corn export arena. And Canadian corn imports is one of them. China is always a wild card. Of course, the size of the South American corn crops going to determine potentially what U.S. exports will end up being. And of course, Ukraine, Russia situation. This is probably the first time in my career I have talked about Canadian corn imports. It's important every year, but this year it holds more significance. Canadian corn imports are projected to be up 108% versus a year ago at a record 3.3 million metric tons. I can make a strong case that Canadian imports could be as large as 5 million metric tons. And if that is correct, Canadian, that would be an additional 67 million bushels of U.S. corn export business. Canada already has 3.3 million metric tons of corn, of U.S. corn on the books, and there's still seven months left in the marketing year. So I think I'm fairly confident, and you may see it in tomorrow's report, that you'll see uh, Canadian corn imports be increased at some point going forward. China corn situation. China's pegged to import 26 million metric tons of corn this year. That is down three and a half million metric tons from a year ago. Still a significant large amount of corn. However, China's ag minister is projecting their corn imports to be 20 million metric tons. And last week, a USDA Hitachi estimated their imports to be 20 million metric tons as well. That's a 6 million metric ton difference, and that's pretty significant. Um, last week, USDA Dr. Fred Gale, he specializes in China and Asia. Uh, he released an article out there on a blog spot titled Grain Corruption and Air in the Granaries. And the theme of the article had to deal with fake reporting and phony transactions within China that really makes you question what is the true size of their grain inventories. My personal opinion is China's grain inventories are not as large as their data says it is. And I also believe that China will be a fairly large importer of corn over the next several years. Brazil's corn situation. USDA had their crop pegged at 115 million metric ton. The average trade estimate for tomorrow's report has it at 113.3 million metric ton. 
Brazil corn exports pegged at a record 43 million metric tons. One thing that I want to point out about this chart is the bars that I have highlighted green. Those are years where Brazil has had significant corn production issues. And in every one of those years, U.S. corn exports increased from January to August. And in 2015-16, our exports from Jan to August increased 200 million bushels. In 17 to 18, they increased 500 million bushels. And in 2021, they increased 200 million bushels. Now, I'm sure everyone's been hearing about weather concerns in southern Brazil and Argentina. Um, it's way too early to make the claim that Brazil's going to have a disaster in corn production. Remember, Brazil grows three corn crops, and the largest of those three corn crops is their Sufrina crop, or their second corn crop, which is being seeded as we speak. Their first corn crop, according to CONAB, which is the equivalent of the USDA in Brazil, had their first corn crop just under 25 million metric tons. Their second corn crop is pegged at a record 86 million metric tons. It is difficult for me today to say that Brazil is going to have a disastrous corn crop when the vast majority of their corn production is in their second corn crop and it's not even in the ground. Now we anticipate Brazil will have record corn acres in that Safrina crop. Um, as you know, corn prices are strong, so there's strong incentive for the Brazilian producer to plant as many Safrina acres as he can. But there is concerns, will he be able to get all the inputs that he needs uh, to seed that many acres? I do want to point out a 5% below trend yield in Brazil's Safrina corn crop equates to a little over 8 million metric tons of lost production. Now, I think the general feel is we've already lost maybe 2 to 4 million metric tons in Brazil's first corn crop. And how much we lose or gain in the second corn crop is yet to be determined. Argentina corn production pegged at 54 million metric tons. Average trade estimate in tomorrow's report has Argentina corn production at 52.1 million metric tons. I have seen private estimates for Argentina as low as 41 million metric tons. Um, the general feel or consensus is Argentina corn crop is getting smaller. And uh, the theme that I'm starting to paint here is, is world corn supplies are not getting larger. They're getting smaller. And, you know, if we've lost two to four million metric tons in Brazil's first corn crop, and you believe the, the low end of these trade estimates out here, well, you could see where world corn uh, supplies due to reduced production in South America could certainly drop 10 to 15 million metric tons. Ukraine corn situation. Ukraine had a record crop, anticipating record exports out of Ukraine. The thing you need to know about Ukraine corn right now, there is roughly 600 million bushels of unshipped grain in Ukraine. What happens to those bushels should Russia invade Ukraine? You know, will, will, uh, ocean freight companies continue to send ships in there knowing that there's a war. Uh, we just don't know. But as long as there's tension there in the Black Sea, that's going to continue to lend support to commodity markets. And we certainly can't afford to have any lost production in South America because we're anticipating world corn exports to be up almost 25 million metric tons at a record 204 million metric tons. And I can paint a picture where world corn exporter stocks to use ratio could drop below 10% with some lost production coming out of South America, which would be at an historically low level. 
as you know, we've had a tremendous run uh, <clears throat> on old crop futures up there to that 640 level on May. Um, I would point out that our seasonal charts would tell us that old crop futures usually top out about the first week in March. Um, I am a strong proponent of marketing some grain just based on these seasonal patterns. Manage money, funds position, they're long a little over 360,000 corn contracts. Um, obviously, managed money likes to use commodities as a hedge against inflation, and we certainly have inflation. As long as we have inflation, and as long as we have ideas that maybe South American production is getting smaller, I don't see the managed money liquidating their long positions anytime soon. Corn stocks versus price chart. The red bars are stocks, the blue line is price. Corn stocks, this is where we're pegged at right now today. Um, I've painted a picture here where I don't believe our corn stocks are getting any larger. And I believe that they are getting somewhat smaller. We just don't know how much smaller yet. There are some people in the trade that think our corn stocks can get down to 1.1 to 1.2. What's this tell me? This tells me that corn prices stay well supported. Something that I want you to take away from this chart is these two black lines, $6 and $7. Look at how many opportunities you've had since 2006 to sell corn futures above six bucks. Those opportunities have not been there all that often. And take it a step further, the opportunities to sell futures above $7 is even less. Keep that in mind as you continue to market your grain and formulate your marketing plans. Moving on to what acres is gonna be this spring, there is a wide range of estimates out there. Uh, the trading range on uh, soybean acres this spring is anywhere from 87 to 91 million. Corn acres anywhere from 90 to 93 mil and a half million. Um, Well-followed IHS market, which is the former Informa group, they have corn acres at 91.5 million. Current economics don't scream more bean acres, not for a farmer at least here in the heartland. Um, 190 corn, 550 a bushel, which the farmer could have probably sold that yesterday. Uh, 60 bushel beans at $14 bushel beans, it argues corn. Um, so I think soybean price for new crop uh, has a little more work to do. And, uh, you know, corn and beans are going to continue to fight one another here for acres. Uh, clear on up into the spring. Trend yield 179 and a half. And if we get 91 and a half million corn acres, and I have demand increasing a little bit next year, um, and I have our carry out this year dropping to one four, you can see there that we still keep our ending stocks at uh, adequate levels, but we're certainly not building stock. Um, that keeps our ending stocks right here where we're at today. Um, that should continue to remain supportive for new crop futures as well. These seasonal patterns would tell us that, that uh, if you believe in the seasonal charts, it would tell us the highs aren't in yet for these corn futures. That would tell us that uh, these futures don't usually top out until June. Russia, Ukraine, NATO stalemate. 90% um, or over 90% of Ukraine's exports pass out or come through this region right down here. What happens should Russia invade Ukraine? I don't have the answers. But yesterday, Biden and um, the German chancellor, they presented a united front at the press conference Obviously, NATO is going to, to impose sanctions uh, that uh, hurts Russia uh, in an economic way. 
uh, should they choose to invade Ukraine. Definitely the West will lock Russia out of the U.S. dollar. They'll lock them out of the SWIFT banking system, which is the banking system used to facilitate bank wire transfers throughout the world. Uh, Russia could still export their grains. Uh, they may have difficulty getting paid for it, though. I don't know what happens here. I don't like what I see in the news with this situation. Um, I hope we can find a resolution here um, that, uh, that everybody can live with that doesn't involve an invasion and loss of life. But Putin just doesn't come across to me as the type of person that just take, picks up, the, up his ball and goes home without getting something in return. Now, I'm sure we have some listeners on here this evening that's got uh, a very strong and close Ukrainian, Ukrainian heritage. And this is one of the downfalls to a virtual meeting because I'd love to hear their opinions and thoughts about this situation. I recently acquired a fairly large collection of old magazines of various types from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I have enjoyed looking at them and reading some of the articles, but I have really enjoyed looking at the advertisements, especially the advertisements that were printed during the war, because they were all tailored to the war and fighting the war effort. I learned that in the 1950s, if you had white wall tires that made you appear smarter, and the 1963 Chevy Impala was the most comfortable thing since your grandmother's lap, which to me just sounds a little bit creepy. But as I was going through these magazines, it quickly dawned on me that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And there has been a lot of changes over the last 75 to 80 years. The cell phone has replaced the telephone. We no longer open up a can of beer with a can opener. We have removed some faces from some products. And we no longer have sports stars advertise and promote cigarettes and tobacco products. But what I realized was the ads have changed over the years, but the headlines have remained the same. The headlines in the tabloid magazines in the 1950s are the same as the headlines on the tabloid magazines today. In 1947, we were trying to understand the Russians. In 1971, we were concerned about the growth of the Soviet military power. 1956, Afghanistan, wild frontier in the Cold War. 1967, the roots of bitterness in the Middle East. Immigration laws, 1956. 1969, we're turning the Great Lakes into a hopeless sewer. And let's end handouts to the rich. Basketball scandals, can they ever be stopped, 1963. And one of my favorite headlines that I found from the 1947 Saturday Evening Post, football pros must be babied. And here we are, 75 years later, and just a few days away from the Super Bowl, and we still have to baby our professional football players. My point is, is the headlines today are not a whole lot different than what the headlines were during our parents and our grandparents' generation. Soybean, soybean to carry out pegged at 350 million bushels, uh, carry out to use ratio estimated at 8%. The average trade estimate uh, has Soybean ending stocks falling to 316 million bushels in tomorrow's report. The USDA has soybean crush up 2.3% at 2.19 billion bushels. Uh, our cumulative crush through December is right at 750 million bushels. 
down two and a half million bushels from a year ago. Our crush Jan through August is going to have to be up 3.7% versus a year ago in order to meet the USDA crush goal. That's only 52 million bushels. And I think that's easily doable. Uh, soybean crush margins are strong clear into the summer months. And a year ago, our soybean crush rate fell off dramatically February forward in anticipation or ideas we were going to have tight soybean stocks. And a year ago, the month of February was brutally cold and our crush rate dropped off dramatically. I think soybean crush will be 20 to 25 million bushels larger than what the current USDA estimate is. And it could be as much as maybe 50 million bushels. Domestic usage of soybean oil here in the United States is estimated to be up 8.1% versus a year ago. And that is simply due to anticipated increase of soybean oil being used for the produce for the production of biodiesel or renewable diesel. Renewable diesel has the potential to really change our future acreage mix here in the United States. Now, renewable diesel is a diesel fuel that can be made out of soybean oil or a fat, um, and it has the same properties as diesel fuel that is made out of, of petroleum, uh, but it is a much cleaner uh, fuel. And this has all arrived from the low carbon fuel standard coming out of California. Our renewable diesel capacity here in the US right now is just under a billion gallons. There is between projects currently under construction and proposed or announced capacity to take that up to over 5 billion gallons. Uh, by 2023, to 2024, our renewable diesel capacity should be somewhere between two and a half to three billion gallons. That has the potential to really change maybe the acreage mix here in the United States. Um, our soybean crush capacity continues to increase. Uh, but the thing you need to take away here is, is to produce 500 million gallons of renewable diesel it would take 7 million soybean acres. So maybe some of you have heard out there some analysts projecting that soybean acres may need to be as large as 100 million acres in the next three to four years. When you hear those claims, this is the driving factor behind it. We are adding crush capacity here in the United States, it seems like almost weekly here lately. Uh, just last week, there was two additional crush plants announced uh, in the state of Nebraska. Um, the red or the green and yellow dots are all existing plants, except this one right here, that should be green. The red ones are announced crush facilities that are projected to be built or in the process of being built. And not all of them are on this map. There's, there's one down in, I think, Louisiana or New Orleans area that's proposed to be built as well. Uh, but the point is, we are adding crush capacity in a big, big way. Uh, one thing that I would point out here about acreage mix, um, you know, up here in North Dakota, you can see we're adding some, some uh, crush capacity up there in North Dakota. Well, when I was in the business and growing up in the business, if you lived in North Dakota, you were supposed to grow wheat and grow oats and, and all these other different crops. And we've been growing more of corn and soybeans. You know, if you're going to build these crush facilities up there, somebody's going to feed it. And so, so that certainly would argue that you could continue to see corn and soybeans or soybean acres expand up there in North Dakota. Um, U.S. bean exports pegged to be down 9.5%, uh, 2.05 billion bushels. The USDA has our bean exports projected to be down 9.5%. 
Our soybean export sales are down almost 23% versus a year ago, and our inspections are down almost 24% versus a year ago. And this strictly has to do with China. China's soybean commitments uh, from the U.S. through January are down 23% versus a year ago. <laughs> Although they still have a pretty good chunk of soybeans on the books, and if you have noticed lately, we have been announcing new soybean sales almost weekly for the past week. China's soybean imports projected to be at a record 100 million metric ton. Uh, world soybean usage expected to exceed production by 2.3 million metric ton. And South American soybean crop was pegged at 139 million metric ton in January report. The average trade estimate for tomorrow has that crop dropping down to 133.5 million metric ton. That's 5.5 million metric ton uh, difference between January. Private estimates I have seen as low as 125 million metric ton. Uh, soybean exports pegged at a record 94 million metric ton. One thing I wanna point out is the red line here. That is Brazil's domestic usage. Brazil's domestic usage of soybeans does not change much based on production. It stays fairly constant. So if we have some losses in Brazil bean production, uh, it's gonna be exports that get hit. And uh, that should move some additional export demand back to the United States. Argentina soybean crop pegged at 46.5, average trade estimate, and DeMar's report has that crop at 44.3 million metric tons. Paraguay crop pegged at 8.5 million metric tons. Uh, private estimate has that crop uh, as small as 4 to 5 million metric tons. Um, I would point out uh, private estimates out there, I've seen Argentina soy crop as low as 40 million metric tons. Um, we have already lost nine and a half million metric tons of production in South America from the December to the January report. And I just painted a picture here and just based on the expectations for tomorrow's report that we could lose another 10 million metric tons of production. That's almost 20 million metric tons of production since December lost in South America. And that's significant. And that, that crop size down there could be even smaller than what the numbers say tomorrow, because we're anticipating world soybean exports to be up 6 million metric tons at a record 171 million metric tons. And we have record world bean meal and oil demand and we have already world soybean ending stocks and stocks to use ratio falling to the lowest level since 2015-16. And right now, if you look at the combined ending stocks of Argentina, Brazil, and the U.S., they're already at the lowest level since 15-16. And I certainly anticipate this number here to get smaller after tomorrow's report. World soybean oil stocks to use ratio, record low 5.7%. Other major veg oil stocks to use ratio, also at a record low level. You are going to continue to hear more and more about vegetable oils in the next several years. Old crop beans, water run, um, up almost four bucks from the low uh, this past November. I think the U.S. producer is probably 90% plus sold on old crop soybeans. Um, um, manage money, they're long somewhere around 160,000 contracts of soybeans. As long as there's ideas that South American crop is getting smaller and we have inflation, I don't foresee them liquidating their large position anytime soon. Bean stocks versus price chart. Um, this is where our carryout is right now. Um, I could make an argument that our soybean crush number will be anywhere from 20 to maybe even 50 million bushels larger than it's currently projected. Uh, I could see, depending on 
the the size of the South American bean crop where maybe our bean exports could be 100 million bushels larger than currently estimated. The point I'm making here is it looks like this carryout number is getting smaller. And you start increasing our exports to 100 million, another 20 to 50 million for soybean crush, and you're taking this number from 300, you know, down towards this 200 million bushel carryout. What's that mean? That means soybeans continue to stay well supported. Um, point I want to make about this chart that I want you to take home with you. This black line, $15. Same thing here as I told you with corn. Since 2006, how many opportunities have you had to sell soybean futures at $15? Take it another step up to this $16 level, those opportunities have been even less. Just keep that in mind as you continue to market your grain. Um, seasonal patterns would tell us that uh, old crop beans continue to rally uh, on into the summer months. New crop, uh, Forma has bean acres pegged at 87.8 million. <coughs> uh, trend line yield at 51 and a half. Uh, and you can see here, I've got demand increasing next year from this year, uh, but I'm using here in this example, our carry in at 350, I just told you where there's a possibility that could drop to 250 to 200. And should that be the case, well, you can see here are our bean ending stocks uh, with 88.8 million acres, uh, our bean ending stocks would, would, would drop from where they're projected out today in that situation. I think new crop soybeans has more work to do to make sure they secure enough acres. Um, you look at uh, um, this stocks to use chart, I think new crop beans stay well supported, but also keep in mind, you know, we talked about how many opportunities you've had to sell uh, $15 beans and $16 beans. Well, the story is the same. How many opportunities have you had to sell $14 bean futures since 2006? Seasonal patterns would tell us that new crop beans continue to, to rally and top out there in June, July. And once again, I encourage you to market some bushels just based off of these seasonal patterns. The American worker is burnt out. Um, U.S. unemployment rate at 4%, uh, that is, is still up from the 3.5% that we've seen prior to the COVID pandemic. Uh, U.S. labor participation rate at 62.2%. Now, that's rallied con considerably from the low, but it's still down from the 63.4% we've seen prior to the pandemic. I think the US labor market is pretty much at full employment. We just simply lost a certain section from our labor pool through early retirement or two income family, one, one parent decided to stay home with the little ones due to daycare issues or whatnot. And I think that, that there's a percentage of them that simply will never come back into the labor pool. If you think history repeats itself, this chart screams that we are due for a period of higher inflation. And we already have high inflation at 7%. On Thursday, we get a new, num new CPI number. The trade is expecting that number to rise to 7.3%. If you don't think that interest rates can increase dramatically, quickly, just look at this chart. And look what the Fed did back in the late 70s, early 80s to get inflation under control. They increased interest rates quickly uh, and in a very fast manner. I don't think people realize, and, and my, personally, I, I don't realize it either. It's hard for me to really wrap my head around this. But, but I don't think people fully comprehend the amount of money that has been thrown in the economies throughout the world. Between 
the central bank liquidity and the injection and the government stimulus packages here in the US, it equated to 44.4% of our GDP. And it wasn't just here in the United States, it was modern economies clear throughout the world. And at the end of the day, it amounted to 28.4% of the world GDP. Just unbelievable the amount of money that has been thrown into the economy, not only here in the US, but throughout the world. I think the Fed's got themselves backed in a corner and they're going to struggle getting out of it. I don't know how you orchestrate a soft landing uh, from all this, but I certainly hope they can figure it out. Bad policy, corporate welfare run amok. Here in the United States, we had a program called Paycheck Protection Program. It was a program designed so employers wouldn't have to lay people off during the pand pandemic. We loaned out almost $800 billion under that program. So far, almost $675 billion of that has been forgiven. I am still waiting for an answer from my politicians as to why we are forgiving loans to companies and individuals who remain profitable through the pandemic. Now, I'm not picking on this company. This just happens to be a company I'm familiar with. But these examples are everywhere. In 2020, they made almost $6 million. In 2021, they made almost $25 million. In the last two years, they made $30 million, yet they got to keep almost $1.7 million in taxpayer money that they did not have to pay back. The employees didn't see those funds. That just trickled down to the shareholders, which continued to add to the divide between the haves and the have-nots. Over here is the average corn farmer in the state of Iowa got over $17,000 in PPP loans. The average soybean farmer got just under $17,000. I showed you when I started out my presentation that farming and agriculture has been pretty good over the last two years. Wheat outlook, uh, world wheat production exceeding uh, or usage exceeding production by almost 9 million metric tons. We have world wheat ending stocks falling slightly. Uh, U.S. wheat ending stocks at their lowest level since 2013. Uh, soft red wheat stocks still at historically low levels. Uh, world wheat demand continuing to grow, as does world wheat imports. Uh, Ukraine, Russia, 29% of the world's wheat exports come out of that Black Sea region. Um, that's important should we have, uh, have a war break out over there. Major world wheat exporter stocks to use ratios, record low level. Um, should continue to remain supportive to wheat. Um, winter wheat area seeded up almost 750,000 acres. Informa has all wheat acres up one and a half million versus a year ago. And you can see here using Informa's estimates, um, should we have trend line type wheat yields, we don't really build our wheat ending stocks a whole lot from where they're at, but would still maintain at fairly adequate levels. Uh, wheat, I think 750 to eight bucks is probably pretty decent trading range. Um, and our seasonal charts would tell us that uh, July wheat usually tops out there in February um, and beast wheat usually tops out in Jan, Feb as well. Um, with that, I want to thank you for taking the time to log in, giving me the opportunity uh, to visit with you. Um, we'll open it up to some questions. Perfect. We're just, I'm just going to pop on here, Jeff. So, uh, like, thanks so much for the great insight into the market. I know many of us are waiting as we try and navigate such a volatile market uh, to hear your spin. So, thanks for shedding some more light on what's really going on.
Uh, we actually have a bunch of questions. So um, are you ready, Jeff? Well, I think so. <laughs> okay. The um, computer hasn't crashed on me here, so. Yeah, see, we're doing well. We're doing good. Don't we're, worry. We're doing well. <laughs> uh, okay, first question. What is a good yield per acre for corn and beans in Brazil and Argentina? Can you comment on that? Yeah, I can. I have that data. I don't have it in front of me. Um, um, Brazilian yeah. corn yield, don't quote me on this for Brazilian corn yield, uh, but it's 80 acre or 80 bushels an acre or so, I believe. Uh, okay. Get, get, their, get their name, and uh, I have slides on it. And I will, I will share those slides with them. Okay, perfect. So we'll come, we'll get you some more information for the person who but asked. But I that. have that data. <laughs> I have that data. Perfect. Well, uh, we can just go to the next one. We'll kind of come back to that once we get the data. Um, where does Brazil, well, I don't know if you can answer this one either, but where does Brazil get the majority of their fertilizer inputs? I know fertilizer isn't really your thing. Do you have any, any idea? That's, that is not my forte. Um, I think, I assume they get it, a lot of it from the same place as we do, but I, I, I do not know. That's okay. Just, uh, you know what, it's probably the same as what you're saying. So um, our next question is, what are predictions for interest rate increase and potential impact on production for 2022? Uh, I think the Fed's and the general consensus will see at least three rate hikes this year here in the United States, uh, probably four, or maybe four. Um, when you're starting at zero and you're just going to increase at a quarter percent each time, um, that really, it has an effect, but it really doesn't have that big of an effect, I don't think, on people's decisions. Um, now... They continue to inch interest rates up there and get interest rates up there to four or five percent eventually. Why that might be a game changer, but we have a long ways to go until we get to that. I mean, heck, we're starting at a basically zero, so right, we got some time then. <laughs> uh, okay, next question. Um, what about electric vehicles taking place of biofuels? Can you comment on that? Yes, um. I have always said in the last several years, and I left that slide out in this year's presentation, but for the last several years, I always had a slide that said uh, um, electric vehicles is the largest threat to ethanol production. And I still believe that. Um, and I, with the new administration, that's accelerating things. But if you remember in my presentation, I had where our soybean crush capacity is increasing dramatically here in the United States over the next two to three years. And all driven by this renewable diesel. So okay. we're going to have to find more soybeans to crush to meet that renewable diesel demand. And this renewable diesel, it's there's big oil that's getting behind it and building refineries. So I don't think it's going away anytime soon. And there will probably be other states that jump onto this low carbon fuel standard as well. But the picture that I can see here happening is as electric vehicles become more prevalent, we use less gas, we use less ethanol, therefore we grow less corn acres and we start to grow more soybean. And there's people out there that would argue that ethanol doesn't make sense and never has made sense. And I'm not going to go down that road, but I can understand their mindset behind it. Um, okay, perfect. That's a, that's a great answer there. And I think that actually answered a couple of our questions here. So let me just look for the next one. Um, okay, Jeff, will spring wheat acres in the Northern Plains switch to soybeans with the recent bump in prices? Very Wait. well could. It very well could happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we still have an acreage fight going on here, and that fight is going to continue clear up into time to pull the uh, planters into the field. Perfect. Uh, okay, and then the next question, um, is the Biden administration being tough enough on China? What, what are your thoughts there? They certainly haven't backed down from China on uh, 
on anything that Trump uh, put in place. Um, he's he's maintained it and kept it. Uh, where this goes forward, I think Biden's going to hold the line on China. I don't see him backing down on any of this stuff that Trump implemented. Implemented, um, you know, if he does, he's going to appear weak on China. And I think the vast majority of Americans, regardless of what your political position is, whether you're you're on the left or on the right, uh, support a hardline stance against China. Right. Okay, I think we actually had another question revolving around that. Um, well, what, well, here, what's your prediction for the midterm elections in November? Republicans, uh, Republicans clean house. Clean house, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. I, it, Republicans have an opportunity here if they play their cards right to to um, to grab the Senate and the House both, really, I think. Okay. We'll just have to see how it plays out, I guess. <laughs> Stay uh, tuned, right? Stay tuned. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay, next one. Uh, back kind of to the, the biodiesel. So does it make economic sense to make biodiesel out of soybean meal at the current fuel prices? Um, and is there margin in that for the biodiesel manufacturer? There's a little yeah. bit more. So if, sure. if they say... Bi the biodiesel manufacturer probably has some margin in it, but keep remember uh, our biodiesel sector here in the States is subsidized by the government to the tune of a dollar a gallon. And then the way this whole low carbon fuel standard stuff works, there's, there's low carbon fuel credits that get sold, bought and sold. And I'm not completely in tune with how all that works but uh you know can the the sector stand on its own without subsidies no not today right and then just kind of to add to the last little bit of that they said if no what does crude oil have to trade at to make it economically feasible to crush beans for biodiesel i do not have that answer okay i'd have to run some math on that well, we're gonna, we always have to ask you the hard questions, don't we? Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that answer. At what level would, would prices need to be to make it make that all work, right? I guess, right. here you go. This would be a rough estimate. You know, obviously, it's being subsidized by a dollar a gallon by the, the government. So it would have to be at least a dollar a gallon higher than what it is now, right? Right. To make it work. No, it makes sense. Uh, okay, so next one. Uh, why are Canadian imports increasing? Uh, they said example for corn imports. I believe you touched on that before. That that was that's due to the drought in Western Canada. Western Canada. Okay. Yeah, the drought in Western Canada obviously just had horrendous crops there, just burn up, right? Right. And so they they didn't produce it, so now they're importing it across the border from the U.S. Right. Okay, makes sense. Um, what percentage of new crop do you think we should have sold and what percentage of old crop do you think the farmer today should have sold if you were to kind of give us some figures? Oh, I, you know, old crop, I, I think the, the producer here in the U S on old crop, at least soybeans, I think he's 90% plus sold on corn. He's probably getting 70, 75% sold, uh, new crop 10 to 15% on both. Okay. You know, twenty percent. Uh, how do you tell someone not to sell at these prices, right? Right. Depends I mean, on how much risk. prices are good. I understand inputs are high, but um, it's hard for me to tell someone to hold on to it when you have the prices that we have today. Right. Exactly. And I guess how much risk they want to have too. Um. Next question is, what effect will an interest rate hike have on the U.S. dollar, do you think? I, I don't think it'll have a whole lot of effect on it. You know, everybody likes U.S. dollars when there's issues in the world, right? Right. You know, once we started to have some concerns here, you know, this whole 
Bitcoin thing was the grabbing the headlines almost daily for a while. And then when we started to have some concerns and fear of, of a war breaking out in the Black Sea, why, you know, people ran from the, the digital currency world. So, right. Okay, good answer there. We've got a couple more here. Um, back to the kind of inflation. So we see inflation in inputs as much as anything else. How much does increased cost of production matter to the market? You've kind of touched on it a couple times, but you kind of come uh, obvi Obviously, the market, uh, you know, the, the market uh, has to factor in the inflation. And you would have to assume the prices that we're seeing today you know, inflation is some of the inflation's figured into that. Right. Um, and then we also have, uh, let me see here. If inflation does increase, will that ultimately reduce corn and soy prices or will the crude oil that you think will go first? Uh, it, my opinion, inflation, if we can't keep it under control, that will be what tips the apple cart, sends us into a re recession, um, not only in the U.S., but throughout the world, and then that would argue that that all commodity prices uh, will will readjust lower, whether it be crude, crude oil, or, or corn, or soybeans, everything will readjust lower, and, sure. and you know, it in some ways, things feel a little bit like they did in 08. In other ways, they don't. But uh, that's my biggest fear. We can't get inflation under control. We get interest rates up there to where to get inflation under control, and then we we send ourselves into a, into a recession. And I didn't talk about this, but I like to use the term sticky inflation and non-sticky inflation. Okay. And and um, non-sticky inflation would be like commodities. Take for lumber, for example. You know, we get COVID under control. Lumber mills get all ramped back up to capacity. Uh, we get the transportation issues resolved. Lumber prices should retreat and go lower, right? It's right. the sticky inflation. If I have to pay $15 for to to staff my fast food restaurant today in order to get enough help and and we get inflation under control well it's pretty difficult for me to go back to that employee that i paid 15 dollars an hour to and say well i'm only going to pay you 11 dollars an hour now Right. So, so that's what I like to call sticky inflation. That inflation's probably here to stay forever and don't okay. go away, you know? Right. Okay. Um, I think I have four more questions, Jeff. So uh, with the U.S. workforce burnt out, how is the U.S. going to find the labor force to get ahead of the supply chain issues? Good question. Um, well, we need... We need uh, to continue to import labor. Uh, immigrants is part of the answer to that. Okay. Um, the other part of it is, is if we slow down our economy a little bit, you know, obviously start to see some people get laid off. So we have a readjustment there as well. That will, will, uh, bring some more people back into to the labor pool or or fill some of those jobs because they've lost a job and supply and demand if wages continue to go higher and higher you may start to see some of these people who retired early or or change their their situation due to covid come back into the labor force i mean i think there's roughly around two million people that we just lost um, through this whole COVID thing that just disappeared from the labor pool. You know, so there, there, that pool is out there. You know, what's it take to entice 
that pool to come back or a portion of that pool to come back into the labor, the labor market. Okay, perfect. Um, I, well, we're going to wrap up here soon, but I think two more questions. Um, you touched on this before, but what is the government subsidy per gallon for fossil fuels? Um, was It was $1 for biodiesel, did you say? It's a dollar for biodiesel. So I don't know if there is a subsidy on the fossil fuel side. I wonder what it is. Okay. We used to we used to subsidize the ethanol sector here to the tune of forty two cents a gallon, and we okay. phased that out, and it is no longer subsidized at all. It stands on its own. Right. Okay. Perfect. Um, one of our last ones here. Um, oh, where is it? Let's see. Could the biodiesel biodiesel expansion be like the ethanol uh, expansion? Yes. Yes. Yep, it very well could be. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to this renewable diesel uh, headlines um, because it certainly the stars are starting to line up to where you could see see that explosion. And you, I showed you the map of all these additional crush plants that are proposed to be in build. Um, and we do have big oil behind this renewable diesel. Um, so I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but the expansion of it is limited just due to the limited amount of feedstock, right? right. I, I still like to eat French fries from McDonald's. I think that's the only thing I like at McDonald's, but, but you know, <laughs> they got to have oil to, to, to fry the French fries, right? right. And you start, getting, you start getting into this food versus fuel debate again. Um, because veg oils are used all around the world for cooking food. And so you, you'll hear more about the food versus fuel debate too. Um, but yes, it has the potential to explode like the ethanol did. Perfect. Okay. And then just our last one here, Jeff, um, what do you see the number of new crop beans need to get to, um, to get acres needed? Um. 14 and a half to 15, maybe, probably closer okay. to the higher side. Um, you know, prices argue corn today, inputs argue soybeans. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, the farmer is, he's weighing those options as, as you guys and gals know, you're doing the same thing. But here in the heart of the Midwest, we won't alter our rotation here much. I think you'll see more of it in those fringe areas, you know, the Dakotas and, and you know, those type of states. Uh, but okay. we, won't, we won't alter our rotation here in the heart of the Midwest. Okay, perfect. Well, you answered all of our questions. Um, like, thanks, Jeff, for the great insight. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on with us. Um, I think we're just going to do a quick poll question now. So uh, what type of farm do you guys have? So cash crop, livestock, livestock and crops, veg sorry, vegetable and specialty or other. Uh, our next question would be what percentage of unpriced grain do you still have in the bin? So we're looking at none, 25%, 50%, 75% or 100%. Uh, did Jeff's presentation affect your marketing plan? Yes, no, or maybe you don't even have a marketing plan. And then our fourth question is what percentage of grain do you, uh, do you market through Great Lakes Grain? So maybe none, 25%, 50, 75, or 100. So we'll just give you a minute here to answer these questions. And uh, yeah, we'd like to thank Jeff again for kind of coming, coming out and talking to us. And I know we were all uh, his much anticipated marketing presentation for the year. So we're always happy to hear from him. So we'll just give you a couple more seconds here. And then what we'll do is I'll pass it on to Noah after the poll, and he's going to do a, a, a spin to win, and we'll give him a couple of prizes, and he'll wrap things up for us. So I think, I think we should probably, everyone should probably have answered the question, so we'll wrap it up here. All right, so what type of farm do you have? So most of you are cash crop farmers, and if we go to the percentage of unpriced grain, so there's there's none left, it's tied with 25. So there's a little bit left in the bin, but really not too much. And then we, when we go to, did this presentation affect your marketing plan? So 62% of you said it did. So it's kind of interesting to see what Jeff says and 
maybe how it changed what your uh, what your marketing plan is going to be at the end of the day. And then finally, what percentage of grain do you market through Great Lakes Grain? So we kind of have a, a pretty good list across the board, 50, 75 percent, 100 percent, a little bit of you none, but maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll change that here with this uh, good marketing presentation. So uh, yeah, thanks again to Jeff. We're going to have Noah hop on here. He's going to do the spin to win and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. Thank you everyone for participating. Have a great night. Thanks, Rachel. And we'd like to once again, thank everybody for coming today. It means a lot to us. And we try to give you guys as much information as we possibly can to help you guys form your marketing plan and help you make those important marketing decisions. You can continue to stay tuned. We've got more webinars coming up. The next one will be February 22nd with, and it will feature Marcos Rubin, who will again talk about the South American market and what those farmers go through and how that kind of compares to our market. It'll be really interesting. I hope you guys come. We're going to have two more webinars additionally as well. We'll release that information to you as it comes out. And uh, <clears throat> also, I hope you stay tuned and watch me as I interview more people on grain kernels and continue to give you that market information and interview people in the industry and the trade. Now, uh, without further ado, I've got a spinner here. Uh, we're gonna hand out computer monitors. These monitors will help you guys uh, <clears throat> just work more efficiently from your home and continue on with that digital aspect. This way, <clears throat> it'll help, to help us thank you and just help you achieve better. Now, without further ado, here's a spinner. Congratulations, Norman Marinette. We'll be reaching out to you shortly within the next couple of days, and we'll hope to get this to you soon. All right, let's see who else gets the second and last final computer monitor. All right, congratulations, Jerry Martens. All right, we will once again get these out to you in, within a week or so, and we'll be reaching out to you. And once again, thank you everybody for coming on today. There will be a quick survey that pops up afterwards. Thank you and have a good night.